What I want to start off with is showing you how far we've come, especially in the last 10 years, um, or in your lifetime really, uh, in the last 20 years, um, and in, in brain research. Okay, so it actually, so I want to start off with the Egyptians because I think this is really remarkable. Um, so they actually believed that the seat of intelligence for people was in the heart. They didn't realize that the, that the brain was important. And actually they pulled out the heart, or sorry, they pulled out the brain with a, with a hook that they shoved through your nose. They scrambled it around, pulled out the brains because they didn't think they were important. And so when you go to museums nowadays and you look at uh, mummies that... that uh, um, from Egypt, you can see a bunch of stuff in their brain. So they took out all the brains and then stuffed paper and stuff in there because they didn't think the brain was important. Um, <clears throat> however, they did know the brain existed and they, this was actually the first symbol for brain. The first written word for brain came from um, uh, the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics. So a nice, a nice tattoo if you want to get, if you're really into neuroscience. I'm thinking about getting one, so just, okay. Um, and so uh, then when it took, uh, when the Greeks came, um, Greek civilization came along, um, we're starting to think a little bit that the brain might be more important. Um, Aristotle was not the, uh, the person to do this though. He believed that the heart was also the seat of the intelligence, but he thought the brain was a cooling mechanism. He understood that humans have really big brains for our size, and so he thought that the brain was used basically as a radiator to cool the hot bloodedness that was seen in the beasts. So this is what separated humans from wild animals. Uh, the brain as a radiator. And then it wasn't until Hippocrates where he uh, believed that the brain was the, actually the seat of intelligence. Intelligence. Did you find it? Nope, but I can move, so I'll be good. Okay. Okay. So it was in the fourth century BC that we started to think that the brain was important. Now, it wasn't until the early Renaissance that was really the birth of neuroanatomy, and this is because we uh, stepped past uh, the, the human body being sacred, and people started uh, looking at the anatomy of cadavers. And so this was some really um, interesting work by Andreas uh, Vesalis and Thomas Willis, where they, um, they were at medical schools in Europe and began to really take apart uh, heads and, and look at brain neuroanatomy. Um, and so this was really the, at this time, the birth of neuroanatomy. Okay, and so after this time, we're gonna take a sidestep into this um, science that is now debunked um, called phrenology. Um, and so it was at this time that uh, a German scientist named Franz Joseph Gall uh, realized that different parts of the brain did different things. And so at, at first it was thought that this whole mass, you know, this whole mass kind of worked to get, you know, it was kind of ho homogeneous, like your liver. All liver cells are the same. That's not the case in the brain. Different parts of your brain do different things. And so he was the first person to realize that. And he came up with this idea that you can measure skull shape and size, and it reflects the different sizes of different brain regions, which reflect different aspects of your personality. Um, this is, of course, not true, um, but uh, it was the state of the art at the time. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think it's a really interesting example of one of the first examples about how neuroscience kind of uh, penetrated society and really warped the way we think about other people. Um, and so, and I think it's, you know, it's a very interesting and unfortunate case of science and society getting mixed up in the wrong way. Um, so, for example, it was very popular at parties, and it was incredibly lucrative. So you could buy these little human heads, and fake human heads, not real ones, and um, then you could uh, basically measure skulls at parties and things like that. Um, and so, you know, you should always be skeptical of, sci of, of science, where you're, you're, you're going to have to spend a lot of money doing something. Um, but it was re actually used to justify racism and um, reinforce socioeconomic divides. So for example, um, your, um, Europeans used it to really um, uh, forward their thinking that, or forward their, their 
their opinion that uh, European races were better than other races, for example, and they were also used to justify um, the um, rank of specific families and particularly rich families um, in societies. And this is because people who are malnourished and don't have a lot of money, of course, have smaller heads and things like that. And so I think it's a really interesting example of science that crossed public and, and societal opinions in a very bad way. Um, and so we'll come back to this at, at, at some point. Okay, so finally, we have some real science happening here and with the discovery of animal electricity. And so uh, it wasn't until the 1820s that somebody, um, Louis Galvani, really understood that the nervous system works or runs on electricity. And the, reason, and the way he was doing this is he uh, accidentally sideswiped a frog, legs, frog legs. Um, I don't know if he was planning on eating them or not. I'm not sure, quite sure what he was doing with the frog legs. But then he saw that he, they, they twitched. And so this was our really first insight into perhaps the nervous system is actually um, run on electricity. And so this was actually, uh, I think, a really cool study. One, it uses frogs, which I'm a, I'm a fan of. Um, two, and it was the insight into how uh, the nervous system is regulated by electricity and specifically ion channels. Um, and so we're going to come back to ion channels and how important they are in neuroscience uh, in, a, in a couple of lectures. OK, so finally, one of my heroes in neuroscience um, is uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, and so he and uh, Camilo Golgi were really the first pioneers to study neurons. And so they really discovered that the um, that neurons are the basic unit or functional units of the brain. And the way they were able to do that is that Golgi uh, made a or developed a technique to stain neurons. Um, and then to be able to look at a single neuron with its cell body and their axons that went through the brain. And then uh, Santiago Romani y Cajal, uh, he spent his life drawing a bunch of different neurons in different brain regions, in different animals, and it, um, that sounds like an awesome job. I kind of wish I had that job. Um, but uh, he was really the first person to map out neuronal anatomy in the brain. And for that, the two, these two gentlemen shared the Nobel Prize in 1906, one of the first Nobel Prizes to go to, to neuroscience. Okay, so, but, so this was kind of a historical overview, but how far those people came in neuroscience and in understanding how the brain works is nowhere near as far as we've come in your lifetime in the last 18 to 20 years of how we understand uh, the brain. And so that happened because a lot, one, a lot more people work on the brain nowadays, and two, we have a lot of technological advances that allow us to manipulate brain function, to study the function of neurons, and to study how those neurons work together. Okay, and so now we can take on very much more complex questions about how the brain works. So for example, we're going to talk a little bit about language, um, something special humans can do, um, how sensory systems, um, how we perceive the environment. So your brain has to integrate you know, the visual information, the smells, the tastes of the, your, hopefully you ate breakfast this morning, um, and all these things get integrated into your brain and how that works. We're also going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, bonding or social bonds. So social bonds are also very important to, to human health. Um, people who have strong social networks live longer. What is your brain doing on love, on lust, these kinds of things. We're going to talk about that. And it's actually these mechanisms that promote uh, drugs and addiction um, that also promote love. Um, and so we're going to talk about how these two things are intertwined as well. We're also going to talk about how you can form, implant, and erase memories. These are really state-of-the-art neuroscience, and so um, both in, in mammals and in humans. And then we're, at the end, we're going to get to the good stuff, which is free, um, talking about free will and consciousness. OK. So finally, um, I want to 
end this little history thing on right now, which is why does thinking matter in this neuroscience class? So why do they have a thinking matters based on neuroscience? And one of the reasons is because the, the brain is, the la is one of the last frontiers in science. It's really complicated. We still don't know what's going on. Um, and we, even though we've come a long way, we have a really long way to go. And the reason why I think it's important is because you are going to be the people that take the next step to really understand the human brain, how it controls our body, and how it, you know, how our mind rests in the brain. And so I think it's important to really bring you up to speed and get you excited because you're the people that's going to be figuring this out. And second, um, I like this quote by uh, Janet Nap Napolitano which I'm going to read to you. So the public dialogue about science is perhaps the most vital and most fraught national conversation not taking place in our country, and the ramifications are profound. And so, meaning that a lot of the, soci you know, a lot of the societal problems that we're facing now are related to neuroscience. And so it's important to understand, even if you don't plan on being a neuroscientist or majoring in STEM fields, that you still understand what's going on and how brains work. All right, so I want to see um, kind of what you think about uh, what, what you think about the brain. Okay, there are more neuron connections in your brain than stars in the universe. Is that true? Okay, um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to go through all the questions and then we can go back and look at all of them, okay? All right, there are left-brained people and right-brained people. There, you're not going, I just want to see what you want to put. There's no right or, well, there is a right or wrong, but <laughs> I'm not going to attach it to your name in any way that is graded. Okay. All right. What percent of your brain do you use? Okay. Uh, is brain size a measure of intelligence? Meaning the bigger the brain you have, the smarter you are. Okay. All right. At what age is your brain fully developed? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and Do people learn better when they're taught in their preferred learning, learning style? Okay. And finally, what topic about the brain do you want to learn about this semester? <laughs> Are there any particular topics that really interest you?
Okay. Consciousness, memory, addiction, love. Okay, great. All things that we're going to be doing. Now, this is the first time I've done this, so I'm going to try to go back and hopefully it'll show your responses. And if not, you could just remind me what they were. Oh darn, it got rid of them. I have them somewhere. Oh good, it's still there. Okay, are there more neuron connections in your brain than stars in the universe? This is a really popular uh, um, idea, but that's actually not true. Um, you have about 100 million neurons in your brain, and if you average about 1,000 connections per neuron, you still don't get up to the number of stars in the universe, which is about 70 sextillion. Um, so quite an, the universe is quite big. Um, now, if anybody asks you that question about the Milky Way, then you can say yes, but not in the universe. Sorry. All right. There are left brain and right brain people. Good job. That is not true. You can have a dominant side. Um, you can have a dominant left side or a dominant right side. This also partially depends on which hand you write with because different sides of your brain control different sides of your body. The right side of your brain controls the right side of your body. So if you are left-handed, you have, tend to have more activity in the right side of your brain. However, you still use both sides of the brain. They have different functions and they work simultaneously together to make you who you are. You use both sides of your brain. My mom likes to say that she's right, she's on the right brain. She's a right-brained person because she's an artist. Um, but that's actually not true. She uses her left side quite a bit. All right. So the next question was, oh, this is really in an interesting split. But the answer is 100%. You use all your brain all the time, especially when you're rocking around listening to me talk, and especially when you are sleeping. Your brain does not sleep when you do. It actually, when you sleep is when you store and catalog all of your memories. You, in fact, when you, when, um, you, when, a mi when in the laboratories, when mice learn a maze, they actually, when they sleep, they're rerunning the maze in their brains so that they can remember what happened. So I want you to remember that this quarter, sleep. Very important, sleep is when you store your memories. Okay, you also use all your brain all the time. If anybody tries to sell you something that increases the activity in your brain from 10 to 90%, do not believe them. Okay, this is also true, great. Or sorry, it's false, false. But you were right is what I meant. Um, okay, so Albert Einstein actually had a smaller brain than average if you consider him very intelligent. Um, and so uh, brain size is not a measure of intelligence. And we're also gonna talk about gender differences a little bit. Um, women tend to have smaller brains than men. However, we also have a smaller body size. And so when you account for body si brain and body size, um, the, the, um, a lot of these differences go away. All right, body size does not mean you're, or sorry, brain size does not mean that you're smarter. Okay, and at what age is your brain fully developed? This is true. Most of you are still developing your prefrontal cortex. Um, all the other bits, bits are there though. Okay, and people learn better when they're taught in their preferred learning style. That is actually not true. You uh, learn better when you're presented with a lot of different ways of learning. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to also talk about how, now that you're in college, how you need to study and how you're going to function and take notes in this class. So one, I'm going to ask you when we're using Poll Everywhere um, or your laptops and your, so when we're using Poll Everywhere, you can use your devices, but when you are not using Poll Everywhere, I would actually prefer if you did not use your devices, it's very, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter are just a click away. And I only have an hour with you to impart a bunch of the knowledge I want to do um, and I want to share with you. And so I would really appreciate it if you didn't have your laptops out. Also, writing things down is a much better way for you to learn than typing on your laptops. All right? We can, I can give you papers on that if you would like 
um, to see it. All right. Any question? And but if you have um, if you have a really really good reason for using a laptop, um, you can you can come see me and let me know. Okay. I really love this list, uh, except I'm oh concussions. Cool. All right. Well, this list is really good for me to know because what we're going to do throughout the class is we have a different we have a couple of different topics. And what I told you is that we're not going to go really, really in depth into learning and memory. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But what I can do now with this list is br is bring up examples where that fit what you're interested in in, in uh, learning about. OK. So now that, it, now that we got a sense of uh, where the class is at, we're going to talk a little bit about how the brain works. Or how do, how do we study something so complicated? You know, you nearly have a galaxy of neurons in your mind. So the human brain is a really complicated place to start with. Uh, so how do, how do we do that? How do we study basic neural function? Well, most studies use animals to understand how neurons are formed, how they, how they function, and how they talk to other neurons in the nervous system. And so <clears throat> uh, humans, really complicated. So to understand basic principles, we start off with other organisms that are a little bit more simple that do the behavior or the task that we're interested in learning about. And so there are a couple of heroes in uh, neuroscience research that we're going to be learning a bit about. One is C. elegans. You might not think you and this worm have a lot in common, but you, but you certainly do. Um, and this animal is really, really easy to study. The reason why this animal is so famous in science um, is that it has 302 neurons, and we know exactly what they are. We know exactly uh, what kind of neurons they are. And so it's really easy to um, mess with these neurons, turn them on or off or delete them, and see what happens um, with animal behavior. Um, because the nervous system of this entire animal is mapped out, it was the person who did this was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2002. Um, and then a lot of people use it now for studying a number of things that are also important to us, including chemotaxis, learning, memory, mating, drug addiction, things like that. The lives of worms are surprisingly complicated. Um, and so a lot of people use them to study neuronal function. Um, the other. Um, invertebrate that we're going to be talking some about is Drosophila, the fruit fly, also a very popular model in uh, genetics. Um, and this brain is also really well understood, the Drosophila brain. Um, and it's also uh, been awarded a number of prizes, including the Nobel Prize, uh, for understanding, because it was the first place or the first animal that we really understood circadian rhythms in the brain. And so how your brain, how your neurons cycle in day and night to tell you when to sleep. That was first discovered and described in the mighty fruit fly. We're also going to be talking a little bit about zebrafish. So now we're getting into vertebrates. Um, a lot of people study this animal because the uh, larvae are transparent. Um, and so when you have a transparent animal, what you can do is you can image directly into the brain while the animal is doing a behavior. You can literally watch its brain light up while it's swimming around or making choices about its world. And finally, we're going to be talking a lot of, uh, about a lot of studies um, in, in uh, mice. All right. Um, so these are the four systems that most people use to study brain function. Um, the, but there are a lot of other un more unusual animal models that people use. So for example, to uh, figure out how animals pinpoint sounds, um, this was work done by Kanishi in uh, barn owls to figure out how you can understand in 3D space where um, an object is located. Um, in frogs, we uh, understand prey capture. Um, we, a lot of language and song or um, verbal learning is done in songbirds. Um, eusociality is studied in bees. And uh, regeneration, for example, is studied in axolotls. So for example, you could cut off the arm of an axolotl and it'll grow its arm back. Um, that's important because mo obviously most animals aren't able to do that. And so this really comes back to this principle called uh, 
Krogh's princi Kro principle that um, says for any given question, there exists an animal best suited to address that question. And so throughout the quarter, I'm going to be asking you to come up with experiments um, that you might use to address some question about the brain. And what I want you to think about is that there are not only those four model systems that I talked about beforehand, but I want you to be able to also think kind of outside the box and think about other animals that might be best suited to address your questions as well. Um, I'm also a little bit biased, I'll, I'll tell you that right now, um, because of the system I work on. Um, so I wanted to also introduce you to what I do. Um, so I work on these guys. Um, they uh, are uh, South American poison frogs. Um, we also work on some in Madagascar. Um, and we study their behavior and their physiology. I've also brought some for you to pass around. No one will die today. Do not worry. I'll tell you why in a moment. Don't open them, though. Even though they won't kill you, you shouldn't open these. Okay, you guys, uh, you guys get a tadpole. Tadpole, but you'll get, if you can pass them around, that would be great. Don't open them. Okay, so there are a couple of reasons we study these, these guys. One, there are a lot of different colors. What you might not realize is the extent of that variation since you've seen them in zoos and so on. Um, for example, these three species are species that we work with in Ecuador and Colombia. Um, so, sorry, these three frogs. Even though they look very different, they're all the same species. Each, each population has a different color and patterning, and this also plays a big role in their behavior and their mate choice. Okay, the other thing we study is how they get their toxins. They actually don't make their toxins themselves, they sequester them from their diet, which is why no one, no one will die here today. Because um, of the frogs that we rear in the lab, so I have a lab colony of poison and glass frogs that we use for research, um, we don't feed them any toxins. So you'll, you'll be fine. Still don't open the container though. Um, the other reason that we study them is that they make a really nice model system for parental care. So not um, each of these frogs is transporting a tadpole on their back to a pool of water, and they make a lot of interesting decisions while they're trying to do this that involve spatial memory. Um, and so these are the questions that we ask. What are the neural basis of parental behavior and how do neonates make social decisions? And what I mean by that is that um, how do these tadpoles decide how to behave when they're presented with different kinds of information? Um, so this is my office when I am not on campus uh, teaching you. Um, and so we do a lot of field work in Ecuador and Colombia with local scientists to uh, accomplish a lot of our research objectives. Um, and so field work um, neuroscience work can happen both in the laboratory and in the field where we make a lot of observations about, you know, animal behavior that has led to a lot of interesting scientific discoveries. So for example, we study how these frogs uh, take care of their babies, how they get piggyback rides, how the dad decides out of the whole forest which, you know, which pools he's going to put his tadpoles into. Um, and then, uh, then parental care stops and he goes back to caring for the rest of the eggs. But there, what, the reason why we study these animals is because there's a lot of differences in who's taking care of the babies. So in this species, only dads care for offspring. Moms lay eggs and leave. They don't do anything else. Um, but in other species, mom go, moms go an additional step. They uh, transport their tadpoles, they put them in pools of water, and then they, um, but then they go an extra step and they come back and they feed their tadpoles, these unfertilized eggs, every three days for two months. Um, and so we, we were trying to figure out how they know how to do that, how their spatial memory works, and then also how um, these uh, tadpoles communicate with their moms that they need food. Um, so I have a little video of that here. So this is a frog that we work on, and this is a tadpole. It's telling its mom vi via vibrational movements that it wants food. Um, and so these are the kinds of studies that we can now ask by studying tadpole uh, brains and behavior of how uh, these neonates communicate that they need food to their moms. Okay, I need those frogs back at the end of the class though. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
don't get me in trouble on the first day. All right, and so, uh, so that's kind of the, that's ends theme one. We're going to talk about how uh, brains work, and we're going to use a lot of different animal models to be able to to look at that question. But you know, looking at all these proxies is often not enough, depending on what your question is. And so, um, oops, sorry. Okay. So animals are study, animal studies are useful for some things, but there are obviously limits. And so what I want to, you to think about, I want you to turn to a partner and I want you to um, think about some, very speci some sp things that are specific to humans that would be very, very difficult to study in an animal model. I know, we have four minutes left. I know. I hope you're able to come up with some. Um, I'm going to wait for four hands to come up, and then I want you to tell me what you talked about. One, two, three, one more. OK. You can go first. Thank you. Mm, depression is a good one. They, they do study this in mice, but I think what we'll see is that the, the behaviors that they, that it's really hard to study behavior in a mouse for this reason. Um, it's a, yeah, that's, depression is absolutely a good one. Uh, well, we both said existential thinking or consciousness. Uh, just because you don't know in animals, they're not all animals at, at least. Exactly. Like How do we study consciousness? How do we ask them? You know? Okay, so there are some really big brain animals out there. Yeah. Dolphins, good example. How do we know whether they are consciousness, conscious or not? So we're going to talk about some of these limitations um, um, to studying really, really complex questions like consciousness and other animals. Morality and ethical dilemmas. That's right. It come, this also is related to consciousness, because how do we ask animals this question? And so you have to come up with some really interesting experiments to be able to do that. And then we're also going to talk about uh, these kinds of uh, these game theory type things um, in human behavior as well. And who is my other one? Oh, you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say human intuition. Intuition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by intuition? Um, I guess like in animals, you could compare it to like their instincts, but just kind of. Um, like this feeling like picking up social cues and stuff like that or just mm. being able to like read between the lines and like I see. know something without being told that. Like, ah, uh-huh, uh-huh. So like subtle observations mm -hmm. um, in, in other, of other people. Or, or situations, absolutely. All right, these are all great things. And so we're going to talk not only about some animal studies, but we're also going to talk about some human studies.